motion by plaintiff's attorney. <clears throat> Area do you reside in, Mr. Syme, Huntington Park? Mr. Syme, you are the Gordon Syme that was named in the first will and not named thereafter, except as executor. Is that right? That's correct. You were named in the last will as executor of the estate of Edwin Walker? Yes, sir. And since the contest has been filed, you have been acting as special administrator of the estate's Yes, sir. Mr. Schooling is your attorney. Right. Mr. Syme, I ask you to bring with you certain checks. Well, let me ask you this. After the death of Ed Walker and your appointment as special administrator, did you collect his property? Yes. And his personal effects? Yes. Did you collect all of his checks? Not all of them. Do you have some checks with you? Yes. Would you produce those, please? Can you tell us, please, what period of time is covered by the checks you have located? 67 through 69. The checks for 1970 are not there? No. And you were not able to find them? No. Mr. Sign, before Ed Walker's death, did you, with Harry Neal, ever go to see Wendell schooling about Mr. Walker? Yes. Would you tell us briefly what was said when you saw Mr. Schooling? Well, we were concerned about Mr. Whitworth at the time. You know. He had object to further response until counsel lays more of a foundation as to what he is going to elicit. It would appear to be immaterial. All right. Did you talk to Mr. Schooling about Mr. Whitworth? Yes, we did. Did you talk to Mr. Schooling about the large sums of cash that Mr. Walker was keeping on his person? Yes. And in his safe deposit box? Yes, we did. What did you say on that occasion? Well, that is immaterial and hearsay. I don't see that that is relative to any matter in this case. May we approach the bench to argue so we do not argue in the presence of the jury? Simply because we have had testimony on the subject, I think it is appropriate. He ought to at least lay foundation as to time and place. All right. As to time, was this after Mr. Walker had moved into the Middleton Court? Yes. That is a leading question. I think the witness can establish the time and place. Just ask him if he knows. Do you recall the date approximately of when you went to see Mr. Schooling? It would be hard. It was in 69, but I don't remember the dates. Where did you see him? At his office. What did you say on the subject that we have been talking about? Well, mainly concerning his age and the money that he had in the safety deposit box and money he had around, too easily gotten to. What did Mr. Schooling say? Well, he advised us to get the money out of the safety deposit box because I guess because of the gift tax, more gift tax if it is in cash, inheritance tax. But that is all, Mr. Syme, thank you. Anything? No questions? Mr. Edmondson? No, sir. All right. Uh, thank you. You may step down. Contestant calls Harry Neal. Mr. Syme, you can take those checks with you. Raise your right hand to be sworn, please. You do solemnly swear that the testimony you may give in the cause now pending before this court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God? I do. Be seated, state your name, and spell the last name, please. Harry Neal. N-E-A-L-E. -E. What general area do you reside in, Mr. Syme, Huntington Park? Mr. Syme, you are the Gordon Syme that was named in the first will and not named thereafter, except as executor. Is that right? That's correct. You were named in the last will as executor of the estate of Edwin Walker? Yes, sir. And since the contest has been filed, you have been acting as special administrator of the estate? Yes, sir. Mr. Schooling is your attorney? Right. Mr. Syme, I asked you to bring with you certain checks. Well, let me ask you this. After the death of Ed Walker and your appointment as special administrator, did you collect his property? Yes. And his personal effects? Yes. Did you collect all of his checks? Not all of them. Do you have some checks with you? Yes. Would you produce those, please? Can you tell us, please, what period of time is covered by the checks you have located? 67 through 69. The checks for 1970 are not there? No. 
And you were not able to find them? No. Mr. Sign, before Ed Walker's death, did you, with Harry Neal, ever go to see Wendell Schooling about Mr. Walker? Yes. Would you tell us briefly what was said when you saw Mr. Schooling? Well, we were concerned about Mr. Whitworth at the time, you know. He had object to further response until counsel lays more of a foundation as to what he is going to elicit. It would appear to be immaterial. All right. Did you talk to Mr. Schooling about Mr. Whitworth? Yes, we did. Did you talk to Mr. Schooling about the large sums of cash that Mr. Walker was keeping on his person? Yes. And in his safe deposit box? Yes, we did. What did you say on that occasion? Well, that is immaterial and hearsay. I don't see that that is relative to any matter in this case. May we approach the bench to argue so we do not argue in the presence of the jury? Simply because we have had testimony on the subject, I think it is appropriate. He ought to at least lay foundation as to time and place. All right, as to time, was this after Mr. Walker had moved into the Middleton Court? Yes, that is a leading question. I think the witness can establish the time and place. Just ask him if he knows. Do you recall the date approximately of when you went to see Mr. Schooling? It would be hard. It was in 69, but I don't remember the dates. Where did you see him? At his office. What did you say on the subject that we have been talking about? Well, mainly concerning his age and the money that he had in the safety deposit box and money he had around too easily gotten to. What did Mr. Schooling say? Well, he advised us to get the money out of the safety deposit box because, I guess because of the gift tax, more gift tax if it is in cash, inheritance tax. That is all, Mr. Sime. Thank you. Anything? No questions. Mr. Edmondson? No, sir. All right. Thank you. You may step down. Contestant calls Harry Neal. Mr. Sime, you can take those checks with you. Raise your right hand to be sworn, please. You do solemnly swear that the testimony you may give in the cause now pending before this court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God? I do. Be seated. State your name and spell the last name, please. Harry Neal, N-E-A-L-E. -E. Mr. Neal, did you know Ed Walker while he lived? Yes, I did. Were you related to him? Only through family marriage. Who is your wife? Violet Sime. And it is now Violet Neal, right? Yes. Is she the lady sitting in the court with the white blouse and blue sweater on? Yes, sir. Violet Neal is the person named in the will of Ed Walker. Fourth named down there? Yes, sir. And she was Mr. Walker's niece, is that correct? That's right. Now, did you at some time receive a gift from Mr. Walker? How do you mean? Let me ask you this. Did you purchase the Middleton Courts from Mr. Walker? Yes, I did. And how was that purchase accomplished? Well, the arrangements were I was to purchase the property at the same price, which he paid for it. I paid a down payment from the sale of my previous house. I paid a down payment, picked up the existing mortgage on the property, and he carried a second mortgage on the property in the neighborhood of $28,000. Did Mr. Walker ever explain to you that he had made a will on the subject of that second mortgage? At the purchasing of the property, there was a mutual agreement between Mr. Walker and myself. Object to the conclusion it was an agreement. He can tell us what was done. Very well, the objection is all right. Just tell us what you said and what Mr. Walker said. Mr. Walker said, I will put it in the will that upon my death, the portion of the money that I owed to him would be canceled as part of the agreement in the will. And the other agreement was that he would live on the property and I would maintain it for him rent free and take care of him while he was living. Now, there was a specific bequest in two of the wills to Violet Neal. That is the will dated September 11, 1962 and the codicil of April 1, 1966. In his will of September 11, 1962, Mr. Walker stated, I give and bequeath to Harry L. Neal and Violet S. Neal. A promissory note dated August 31, 1962. Did he tell you about that provision in the will? I think I was with him in the lawyer's office when he made the will. We transacted the selling of the property through Mr. Schooling, who was his lawyer, and at the same time, on the same day, adjusted the will and changed it there in my presence. Okay. Did he at some later time change the arrangement? Yes, he did. What did he do? It was approximately, I can't remember the year. 
I had been making monthly payments to him, and he approached me. I was on the property every weekend. I had been living on the property and had moved away to Santa Ana. We had been discussing the property and his age and his problems, and he said, supposing we take you off the will, and he says, I will cancel the loan, and he says, that will help make it easier on paying the taxes and things of this nature. 184 boys for five minutes. Direct by plaintiff's attorney. Sir, what do you do for a living? I am a police officer for the Los Angeles Police Department, assigned to Central Division at the time of the arrest, assigned to 77th Division. Okay, how long have you been a police officer? Approximately a year and a half. You were working on June 23, 1998, is that correct? Yes, I was. Sometime after 6.30 p.m. on that date, were you on duty with a partner? Yes, I was. What was your partner's name? Officer Medina. Did you respond to the location of 8th and 64th in the county of Los Angeles? Yes, I did. And when you arrived at that location, what did you first observe? I observed the victim of our radio call and two witnesses standing by with him. Okay, when you say victim, was that the same individual that just walked out of the court? Yes, it is. Did you or your partner walk up and speak to either the victim or the witnesses there? Yes, we did. Who did you talk to? I spoke with the witnesses. Okay, and your partner, did you see who he was talking to? He spoke with the victim. As you were speaking with the witnesses, did something, did they direct your attention elsewhere? Yes, they did. What happened? They advised my partner and myself that the suspects which took his property were walking down the street just north of our location. And did you look in that direction? Yes, we did. What did you see? We saw one female black and two male blacks walking down the street. Female black carrying what appeared to be comforters in her hands. And did you see... Did you do anything after that? We asked the victim if he was sure that that was them. What did he say? He stated yes. What did you do? We then proceeded to the location in our vehicle and detained the three suspects pending our investigation. Did you see anybody from that location in court today? Yes, I do. Could you please identify those people? It's going to be the individual in the light blue long sleeve shirt also the individual in the black and gray striped long sleeve shirt. Mr. Abrone and Mr. McKinley for the record. And at the time you actually approached them, where were they exactly and what were they doing? The female was walking northbound on the sidewalk. The two males were approximately six feet behind her, maybe a little bit less walking also northbound. Officer, I'm going to direct your attention, if you will, to what's been marked people's number one for identification. The diagram with some pictures on it. Have you seen that diagram before? Yes, I have. Okay. And can you maybe mark with an X and a circle around the X? If I approach, Your Honor, place an X in the general area where you first came in contact with the two defendants here in court today. It would have been in front of this location right here, the same building as here and here, indicated people's 2A and B. Thank you. And Your Honor, for the record, he did also make a marking on people's number one on the picture. All right. Now, when you came in contact with the two defendants and the female that was there, did you recover any property? Yes, we did. What did you recover? We recovered a two comforters directing your attention to a set of photographs that's in front of you marked as people's number three on the left side of that photograph. Are you familiar with those two pictures on the left side, top and bottom? Yes, I am. What are those? Those are the two comforters recovered from the female. And what did you do with those items? We returned them to the victim after we photographed them. Your Honor, I have here a two booking photos I would like to mark as people's number five and people's number six. May be so marked, it has been previously shown to counsel. May I approach? You may. I just want to show you first what's been marked as people's number five. Are you familiar with that? Yes. What does it depict? That would be the defendant, Mr. Abrone. Okay, that's a picture of him. 
and showing you people's number six, are you familiar with that? Yes, I am. Who does that depict? That would be the other defendant. I forget his name. Is that the person in court today? Yes, it is. What's that person wearing today? Black and gray striped shirt. Mr. McKinley, thank you. Now the pictures that are in front of you, people five and six, I want you to particularly pay attention to the haircut as is depicted in people's five and six. If the two defendants looked that way as depicted on five and six, on the day of the arrest, yes they did. In fact, do you know whether those photographs were taken? They would have been taken the same day. The same day of the arrest? Yes. That would be June 23? Yes. I have nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you. Cross-examine? Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Jury charge. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the issues in this case are issues of fraud and deceit. Fraudulent representation, or fraud as the term is here used, may be defined as false statements of material facts in a transaction made by one party to another, made with knowledge of their falsity, or made as positive statements of fact, without reference to their truth or falsity, and made with the intent that the other party shall act thereon, when such other party believes such statements and relies thereon and is induced thereby to enter into a contract or a transaction and the statements are false and damage results to him, then such statements are fraud which entitles the party injured to recover damages. Fraud is never presumed and must always be proved and the burden of proof rests upon the parties asserting the fraud. The defendant in this case to prove by a fair preponderance of the evidence, that is, the greater weight of the evidence that he was defrauded as claimed by him. If you find the evidence on this question evenly balanced or that it preponderates in favor of the plaintiff, then you will find a verdict in plaintiff's favor. In order to recover on the ground of fraud or fraudulent representations, the party claiming to have been defrauded must have believed and relied upon the false statements made by the other party in the transaction. And if the party claiming fraud had knowledge of the real facts in connection with the transaction in question and relied upon his own knowledge and information and did not rely upon the statements made to him, then there is no fraud because of the party asserting the fraud is not deceived. In this case, there is no fraud in so far as the contents of the agreement, Exhibit 4, is concerned because it is admitted by the plaintiff that John Henry read the agreement, Exhibit 4, and knew the contents thereof. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the issues in this case are issues of fraud and deceit. Fraudulent representation or fraud as the term is here used may be defined as false statements of material facts in a transaction made by one party to another, made with knowledge of their falsity or made as positive statements of fact without reference to their truth or falsity and made with the intent that the other party shall act thereon when such other party believes such statements and relies thereon and is induced thereby to enter into a contract or a transaction and the statements are false and damage results to him, then such statements are fraud, which entitles the party injured to recover damages. Fraud is never presumed and must always be proved and the burden of proof rests upon the parties asserting the fraud. Now the defendant in this case to prove by a fair preponderance of the evidence, that is the greater weight of the evidence that he was defrauded as claimed by him. If you find the evidence on this question evenly balanced or that it preponderates in favor of the plaintiff, then you will find a verdict in plaintiff's favor. In order to recover on the ground of fraud or fraudulent representations, the party claiming to have been defrauded must have believed and relied upon the false statements made by the other party in the transaction and if the party claiming fraud had knowledge of the real facts in connection with the transaction in question and relied upon his own knowledge and information and did not rely upon 
the statements made to him, then there is no fraud because to the party asserting the fraud is not deceived. In this case, there is no fraud insofar as the contents of the agreement Exhibit 4 is concerned because it is admitted by the plaintiff that John Henry read the agreement. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the issues in this case are issues of fraud and deceit. Fraudulent representation or fraud as the term is here used may be defined as false statements of material facts in a transaction made by one party to another, made with knowledge of their falsity or made as positive statements of fact without reference to their truth or falsity and made with the intent that the other party shall act thereon. When such other party believes such statements and relies thereon and is induced thereby to enter into a contract or transaction and the statements are false and damage results to him, then such statements are fraud which entitles the party injured to recover damages. Fraud is never presumed and must always be proved and the burden of proof rests upon the parties asserting the fraud. The defendant in this case to prove by a fair preponderance of the evidence that is the greater weight of the evidence that he was defrauded as claimed by him. If you find the evidence on this question evenly balanced or that it preponderates in favor of the plaintiff, then you will find a verdict in plaintiff's favor. In order to recover on the ground of fraud or fraudulent representation, the party claiming to have been defrauded must have believed and relied upon the false statements made by the other party in the transaction, and if the party claiming fraud had knowledge of the real facts in connection with the transaction in question, and relied upon his own knowledge and information and did not rely upon the statements made to him, then there is no fraud because the party asserting the fraud is not deceived. <clears throat> the only question of fraud in this case is whether the defendants agreed to execute a promissory note for $3,000 to the plaintiff and delivered Exhibit 4 purporting to be such note and fraudulently stated to Henry that Exhibit 4 was a promissory note for $3,000 and was the note referred to in Exhibit 4 and whether pursuant thereto Henry believed it said instrument to be a promissory note for $3,000. If under the rules given you, you find and believe from the evidence that the defendant, Morris, representing the defendants at the time of making the agreement of settlement represented and stated to Henry, acting for the plaintiff in this case, that the defendants would execute to the plaintiffs a promissory note for $3,000 and that later Morris delivered Exhibit 4 to the said Henry and then stated to him that said Exhibit 4 was a promissory note for $3,000 and was the note referred to in Exhibit 1 and you find that these statements and the making of Exhibit 4 were done for the purpose of cheating and defrauding the plaintiff as claimed and you further find that Henry believed said representations and believed that said Exhibit 4 was a promissory note on which the defendants were personally liable and was the note referred to in Exhibit 4 and relied and acted thereon, then you will find a verdict in plaintiff's favor for $3,000 with interest added as provided for in said Exhibit 4. On the other hand, if you fail to so find from the preponderance of the evidence or you find the evidence equally balanced on either of these issues or if you find that Morris did not make the fraudulent representations as claimed by the plaintiff or you find that said Exhibit 4 was in accordance with the agreement of the parties or that the said Henry at the time of receiving said Exhibit 4 knew the contents and terms thereof, then in either such case you will find a verdict in defendant's favor of no cause of action. The only question of fraud in this case is whether the defendants agreed to execute a promissory note for $3,000 to the plaintiff and delivered Exhibit 4 purporting to be such note and fraudulently stated to Henry that Exhibit 4 was a promissory note for $3,000 and was the note referred to in Exhibit 4 and whether pursuant thereto Henry believed it said instrument to be a promissory note for $3,000. If under the rules given you, you find and believe from the evidence that the defendant Morris representing the defendants 
at the time of making the agreement of settlement represented and stated to Henry, acting for the plaintiff in this case, that the defendants would execute to the plaintiffs a promissory note for $3,000, and that later Morris delivered Exhibit 4 to the said Henry, and then stated to him that said Exhibit 4 was a promissory note for $3,000, and was the note referred to in Exhibit 1, and you find that these statements and the making of Exhibit 4 were done for the purpose of cheating and defrauding the plaintiff as claimed, and you further find that Henry believed said representations and believed that said Exhibit 4 was a promissory note on which the defendants were personally liable, and was the note referred to in Exhibit 4 and relied and acted thereon, then you will find a verdict in plaintiff's favor for $3,000 with interest added as provided for in said Exhibit 4. On the other hand, if you fail to so find from the preponderance of the evidence or you find the evidence equally balanced on either of these issues or if you find that Morris did not make the fraudulent representations as claimed by the plaintiff or you find that said Exhibit 4 was in accordance with the agreement of the parties or that the said Henry at the time of receiving the said Exhibit 4 knew the contents and terms thereof, then in either such case you will find a verdict in defendant's favor of no cause of action. About 10 minutes straight at a comfortable speed. Okay, and we are on question by Ms. Abramson, defense attorney. Go with the wild hair. Okay, ready? Question by defense. And was his training more intensive than yours? We both had the same like intense workout, but it seemed like he had a lot more pressure in his workouts to do well than myself. And did you observe yourself where that pressure was coming from? Well, on a few occasions, his dad, you know, was standing behind him yelling at me. I mean, yelling at Eric like he was his coach, you know. But his dad wasn't his coach. And if my dad did the same thing, I would tell him to get lost because I have a trainer, you know. And, yeah, I think I answered your question. Let me talk to you about a couple of things. Were there a couple of different times when you had a date with Eric, you were supposed to get together with him and go out with him when the date basically was interfered with by his father training him two times? And would you describe was the first time when Eric was still living at Calabasas?